Okay. So you should see a white screen now, which is mine. So uh, let me jump right into uh, what I plan to present today with, a, with two slides as a prelude. Now, uh, Regina has, has told us uh, and described the situation, how it is. And thankfully, she also pointed us toward, towards this WHO initiatives, how we could change it. Uh, now, I uh, imagine myself speaking to experts in physical activity and exercise promotion, and I would like to start uh, with you just checking our track record, our track record as experts in promoting physical activity and exercise. And I have picked out only one of the, uh, as it seems to me, most relevant uh, publications that uh, tell us about the impact of what we do actually as experts and psychologists or, or health behavior specialists uh, in real life. So uh, this is a meta-analysis of randomized control trials. And I would like uh, to digest together with me uh, the highlighted two sentences. One, results show that theory-based interventions significantly impact the, behave, uh, the PA behavior of participants. Yay, great, this is great. There is a significant impact, but check with what you learned in statistics and check Cohen's D, which is the effect size we typically reach. Uh, probably uh, you remember that a D of 0.3 brings about a 58% chance that a person picked at random from the treatment group will have higher scores, that is more physical activity than a person picked at random from the control group. 58% chance of superiority statistically. So that's not much more than a coin toss. So probably we are not as far as we would like to be actually with that. Second highlight sentence, there is no efficacy difference between theories. As a matter of fact, you can take this or that theory and it wouldn't change a lot. We have that small to moderate effect size, that is the 58% chance of probability of superiority uh, as a matter of fact. Second slide for the prelude. If we look at the popularity of theories of behavior change that we can see in the published literature, we, uh, have, we, we, we got the following graph. What you see there is that, that researchers kept on working uh, with the theories of behavior change that are published in the literature and there is a, an increase in work in research articles published year by year. You even see that very steep increase uh, in, th in, in, in empirical research related to self-determination theory. Um, and although I like seeing that so many experts care about that, that topic and uh, th that we're, we're like motivated to change something, but remember, uh, the essence of my first slide. We are using theories to optimize our interventions, which are, let me call, let me call them suboptimal, far suboptimal from what we really would actually like to reach with them. So what I'm planning to do in the next 10 minutes is that I introduce you an alternative theory that is an alternative perspective on how we could manage to become better in a sense of become more efficient with what we're doing in our interventions. It is a new theory which is not thought to supple, uh, which is not thought to substitute uh, things we know and things that work well, but it's a supplementary perspective that might help to change something. 
So I will talk about theory today and not too much about uh, empirical research. The Effective Reflective Theory was published in 2019 and uh, has reached uh, quite, uh, quite attention or, or some attention in the meanwhile. And at the core of the, of the theory is what I tried to illustrate with the boxing gloves up there. Uh, many of us know, or many people know that exercise is healthy. But sometimes exercise, exercising feels unpleasant. And this conflict is at the heart of effective reflective theory. So let me first describe what I mean when I'm talking about feelings. We refer to uh, neuro, uh, to newer uh, neurobiological research. Uh, and if I'm talking about feelings, I'm talking about core effect. Core effect, as it was defined uh, by Lisa Feldman Barrett uh, and her colleague. And she gave that very simple and concise definition, which I like very much. Feelings are like link, like simple summaries about what's going on in your body. That's perspective. Summaries about what's going on in your body are non-reflective in a way that you don't need to think a lot about them. They are always there as soon as you uh, put attention on them. And normally, if it comes to research, you would measure those feelings uh, with uh, something close to that uh, affect circumplex that is, if I ask you now, how do you feel? You probably might be able to answer with regard to how pleasant or unpleasant you feel right now, which is valence, or how, whether you are highly aroused or activated, or whether there is rather low activation at the moment. So when I'm talking about feeling and affect, I'm talking about core affect in exactly that sense. Now, let me talk about how people feel during exercise. Uh, and this is empirical data um, for a first step. So imagine yourself sitting on that bike ergometer and uh, you are doing a, a high intensity, a, a, uh, a, a graded exercise stress test. This is what we did with participants in our lab. And this is data we, me uh, we measured, that is uh, random participants picked out. And what you see on the X axis is their rating of perceived uh, exertion towards the end. And the last measurement point was volitional exhaustion. And on the, the Y axis, you see the effective valence rated by these people. And what you see is trivial in fact, it is that the higher the intensity gets, the more negative, the more, the more unpleasant uh, uh, you feel. Um, very, very easy. Just imagine running a marathon. The last kilometer on your marathon will never feel pleasant. So if you're getting really exhausted, if you are like, like physiologically uh, at your personal limit, this doesn't feel well. And there is one very important theory, and there are, uh, in, in the meanwhile, uh, several dozens, if not hundreds, of, of empirical studies illustrating results on that theory, dual mode theory that aims to explain how intensity and affect relate to each other. So, most basically, uh, dual mode theory uh, describes that within three domains of physical activity or exercise, moderate, heavy, or severe intensity, which are linked to the ventilatory thresholds, in fact, um, we will have a typical or typical trajectories of affect, that is, most people, many people would report feeling better if they exercise or are physically active in the moderate domain. As soon as they come close to the ventilatory thresholds, people will 
differ in the way they feel. Some individuals will, will uh, tell you, will report uh, less pleasurable feelings, while others will report increasing pleasurable feelings. But as soon as you reach the severe domain, uniformly individuals will report unpleasurable, unpleasant feelings. The dual mode theory uh, explains um, this empirical findings in a way that the, do, that the two modes, one of it is uh, cognitive and the other one relates to the interoceptive factors that create that bodily sensations interact in the way uh, it is shown here. Now, building upon dual mode theory, effective reflective theory um, um, has at its core the idea that there are more rational reflective processes, which are named type two processes, processes on the one hand, and effective type one processes that might counteract your beliefs, values, and individuals' rational considerations. So one fundamentally new idea that comes with the, with the ART is that we have driving forces that can get into conflict with, retrain, uh, with restraining forces. And the, the ART specifies these restraining forces in a way that it postulates that exercising feels unpleasant sometimes and under the conditions I just try to describe you with uh, my hint on dual mode theory. So this is effective reflective theory, the process model of effective reflective theory. Uh, I will only go very briefly uh, over it, uh, but I will send, or I actually have sent now a link in the chat uh, to an explanational video on YouTube where you uh, could, if you like, rehearse uh, the things, or you could use that resource for teaching, for example. So effective reflective theory postulates that every exercise related stimulus will result in a type one that is an automatic process that will include automatic associations related to that exercise related stimulus and that creates an automatic effective valuation. That's the core construct of the theory, automatic effective valuation. What it means is the effective valuation is what you automatically feel in relation to an exercise related stimulus. And that automatic effective valuation will create an action impulse that, uh, that, that makes you or that pushes you in, a, in the direction of the behavior or that, that gives you a sort of avoidance impulse. In case and only in the case that self-control resources are available, reflective evaluation might follow. That is, if you have the self-control, if you are motivated and have the capacity to rationally consider your options and to choose what you want to do, it is possible that you can resist an automatic impulse to avoid physical effort or to decide against going exercising. But the role of self-control is crucial for the theory. And I would like to highlight a second aspect uh, that's coming with the effective reflective theory. It postulates that negative automatic affective valuations are learned. And the whole theory is about learning to like exercise because as a matter of fact, we all know that it, it, it will not always be pleasurable to exercise as it, there is that uh, connection to physical inactivity I have just described a few minutes ago. So first thing you should, uh, you should, uh, try to see when you're looking at 
the theory or if you would like to join in researching uh, with, with, with that theory. Is there anything like an automatic process that will influence our decisions and that will have that impact on physical activity behavior? And I've just picked out one study from my group in Potsdam, in which we simply did the following. We asked uh, 88 participants to complete an implicit association test, an IAT, which is a, a, a test that, that uh, is able or that aims to measure automatic processes or automatic associations. And we asked that participants to complete that tests before a 14 week uh, training program. And what we see here is that we were able to discriminate between those who managed to stay in the program by their implicit or automatic associations with exercise. Um, as a matter of fact, you will see if you go into the literature that research studies are accumulating, that automatic processes are relevant and that this might be one of uh, the factors that might have been neglected in the past 20 years, that not everything in our decisions or not all uh, motivational drivers are reflective, but there is something automatic going on and that we have to keep that in mind. Let me come back and get to an end with my presentation. Uh, I showed you data from that study here. And what we, what we did in that study was that at the same time, we were measuring people's facial expressions because we thought, is it possible to see pleasant or unpleasant feelings in their faces? Obviously it was, but if there are like, like signs that can be used, for example, during interventions, and we use AI software uh, to classify, uh, to use algorithms and classify facial expressions. And to summarize what we see there is that, what, that we were able to separate and identify something we call the face of exertion or facial expressions that are characteristic for effective, uh, for feelings of unpleasantness. And uh, you can look at my face now because uh, it's easy to illustrate the face of affect. So if you see that somebody is getting exhausted, he, will, he or she will open his or her mouth. That is a jaw drop, uh, which is perfectly, perfectly logical. You need more air while exercising. But as soon as unpleasant feelings mix in, there will exist, uh, there will come nose wrinkle. Nose wrinkle is something like, like that. Now, if people start doing something like that, nose wrinkling, this seems to be a good identifier for unpleasant affect during exercise. So I would like to give you for the end this picture here. So you see somebody exercising here. What is your diagnosis? How does this person feel during exercising? Does she feel well? Will it have an impact whether she feels well or not? Will these feelings have an effect on her subsequent further decisions to regularly engage in exercise? Is it worth uh, avoiding to create these kinds of feeling, for example, during physical education? Is it necessary to always work at high intensities? These are questions that you might find interesting. And this is what I wanted to present today. So uh, thanks for giving me the chance to giving you that impulse. And well, happy to hear your questions.